Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by co-host William Albrecht and also guest Lizzie from Lizzie's Answers. How are you, Lizzie? I'm good. How are you guys? Doing good. It's good to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I've I've followed your material for a while. I think I actually was, um, I came across your material quite a while back. I want to say probably four, three or four years ago. Wow. Um, I was um, I was actually doing some videos and I want to say you commented on them and I think you were looking into Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism at that time. Uh, now, of course, wow. everybody knows that you, you became Roman Catholic, but could you maybe tell us what exactly was your background and, and what got you looking into Catholicism and Orthodoxy? So I grew up in a church called Churches of Christ, which is part of the Stone Campbell movement from the yeah. 1850s. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of, we always defined ourselves as Baptist without the piano because we right. had acapella worship and really emphasized full immersion baptism as yeah. necessary for salvation. So we thought Catholics were going to hell because sprinkling isn't baptism because it has to be right. full immersion. So it was very anti-Catholic environment. I really hated Catholicism a lot. I didn't believe that they were Christians. When I went to college, I went to a Church of Christ college called Pepperdine University. And a lot of my friends there were converting into Catholicism who grew up Church of Christ. And I didn't really think anything of it. It was just kind of a trend that started happening my freshman year and kept going. And I was like, this is weird. Like, why are people becoming Catholic? But it wasn't until I graduated a year later when one an additional friend told me that they were becoming Catholic. And mm -hmm. I was like stunned. And it was kind of a last straw moment that had been building up for years and years. And that's when I just started researching into the early church, like binge researching. And I remember I read a book on church history by Harnack. And in the first mm -hmm. chapter, or maybe in the second chapter, he talked about how there were monarchical bishops in the first and second century. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? There were bishops? My right. church doesn't have bishops? So from then on, I just kept researching and I saw that the early church looked Catholic and Orthodox. It was just right. obvious. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you came from churches of Christ. I, I knew you were Protestant. I didn't know it was that in particular. I've I've been to some of them locally. In fact, the the local church of, of Christ, um, I want to say the Duck Dynasty guys go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. um I, I think they're part of that that same group. But um, yeah, no, I've I've visited there, I've never actually been part of the churches of Christ, but I know they have for Protestant standards some kind of peculiar views. I think you mentioned there um like baptismal regeneration did i get that right isn't that one of the views that they they pretty much all do there there's some things that are kind of peculiar but did you you said you encountered some anti-catholic material too i'm just kind of curious did you ever come across guys like dave hunt um and chuck missler and some of their anti-catholic material or was it just kind of jack chick tracks that they were handing out or what what, what exactly were you encountering I mean, it was just things I heard in Bible class or from my parents. Like mm -hmm. for a long time, I thought that Catholics only talked to the priest in confession and didn't pray. Like I yeah. thought they weren't able to pray directly to God. And it was the saddest thing ever to think, oh, Catholics can't even pray. And then just the fact that they weren't Christians, that they went by man-made tradition instead of the Bible. It wasn't until 2017 when it clicked that Catholics believed they were going by the Bible, just like mm -hmm. how my church believed they were also going by the Bible mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. every Protestant church. So I didn't think they had, I mean, I knew they had the Bible, but I didn't, I didn't think they emphasized it at all. Sure. And interestingly enough, there are so many ex-Catholics who become Church of Christ. So, so many people at my churches, like my friend's parents were ex-Catholics. So I was like, oh, People who are Catholic end up becoming Church of Christ because it's wrong and it's not Christianity. <laughs> so that's why it was so odd when Church of Christ people were becoming Catholic in my college. Mm. The whole paradigm flipped. What What do you think about Church of Christ that, that um, Catholics are really interested in? What, what exactly appeals to them that they would go from Catholicism to there? We treat communion and baptism almost like sacraments. Mm -hmm. Most 
churches don't believe that baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Most mm. Protestant churches think it's like a symbol of your relationship with God. Right. And then we did communion every single week. And it was, yeah. it's the memorial view communion, but most Protestant churches do it like once a month. If right. at all. If, so, if that maybe, <laughs> maybe usually it's happens. once a year, right. Or Even some optional, of the Presbyterian. You don't have to. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. So, okay. You're reading Harnack and you see, you know, one Bishop per city and you start to say, Hmm, we don't have that. So you start to look into historical Christianity. How exactly did you start to look into um, orthodoxy? I get, I get the Catholic part, but where, where did orthodoxy come into the equation? So there were some Orthodox YouTube channels that I came across and I started actually like Skyping some of my subscribers who were Orthodox and Catholic and they would explain things to me. I came across, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but Ancient Faith Radio, oh, yeah. they're kind yeah. of podcasts talking about oh, yeah. Orthodox. So I would listen to them. And yeah. then I found this website called earlychristianwritings.com mm -hmm. and it just had in chronological order so I would just be reading primary documents as well. Awesome. Yeah, that that's kind of for me, too. I started looking into um, the early church fathers, especially the apostolic fathers. And one big thing that you, you noted here was the office of bishop. That was pretty significant for me when I started seeing, you know, Ignatius of Antioch in the early second century <laughs> teaching this. And of course, I was Presbyterian at the time and we didn't have bishops. So that kind of made me think, hmm, I, I might not be in continuity with the church of the first and second century. So you start to look into different podcasts and stuff like that. What, what made you start to look more into Catholicism instead of orthodoxy? I listened to a lecture by Stephen Ray talking about his book upon this rock which i ended up reading and he just explained that the keys of the kingdom was part of the old testament monarchy that's okay. then being talked about in catholicism so it just connected like the davidic kingdom right. to catholicism so his yeah. book really really helped me out and thinking of it as like he is the first among equals and then the orthodox church split from that and then made the bishop of constantinople the patriarch the first among equals so that was a pretty big deal for me, too, although I, I didn't read Ray. I read um, Scott Hahn on that, but he was appealing to Isaiah and the keys of the mm -hmm. uh, the steward there. So that was pretty appealing to me as well. Now, did you attend any uh, liturgies, Orthodox or Catholic, before you started really considering it? Or was it the appeal of the liturgy that really made you start to look into things? It was definitely not the liturgy. I didn't really like mass or divine liturgy. I'd actually attended divine liturgy in college for a class project. And I always tell people who are attending Eastern Catholic or Orthodox to like give it a go a few times because yeah. it's such a culture shock that at first you're gonna hate it and not understand it. So it wasn't until like the third time I went to an Orthodox church when I really like got into it and enjoyed it. So because I started researching more and realizing that the early church looked Orthodox and Catholic, I began going to divine liturgy. I got really involved in this Orthodox church near where I was living at the time. I would go to Bible studies, Sunday morning liturgy, Vespers during the week. So I really got to know them. And I think I didn't really know that much about Orthodox growing up. So I didn't have a lot of negative stigma as I did with Catholicism. So yeah. it was just emotionally easier. And oh, I yeah. wanted to be Orthodox way more than Catholic. It, it really is a lot easier when you don't have that stigma. Um, well, I mean, when, whenever you do have that stigma, I should say, it, Orthodoxy is a lot easier because it you, you see the continuity um, historically, and yet you don't have all those negative things that you've heard, mm -hmm. um, especially about the Catholic Church. You, you don't have mm -hmm. most of those things there. And orthodoxy safe perhaps icons and stuff like that what mm -hmm. what how did you react to that i imagine that was probably a shock when you walked into an orthodox church and you see all these icons did you just think immediately idolatry what what, what was going through <laughs> your head yeah so the first time i went to an orthodox church in college it was russian orthodox and mm. the narthax which is like i'm sure some of the viewers might not know it's the room before the main worship room where there's a lot of icons and candles 
So I remember immediately like alarm, alarm, um, idolatry, idolatry kind of going on in my head. But I was also weirdly fascinated by it. And I just wanted to walk around and look at them. And I was just thinking, because my church growing up was white walls. We would have stained glass, but no images on it. And it was beautiful. It was a nighttime service. There were candles lighting everything up. And so part of me hated it, but part of me was really, really drawn to it and saw it as mm. beautiful. Yeah, there, there's definitely an appeal there. I, I can relate, though. I, I think the first time I walked in, I was very hesitant. Although I had kind of worked through the theology of icons before I had, you know, walked into um, an Orthodox church, it was still, you know, it's it's different when you're reading about it on paper versus you actually are, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> witnessing all of it. And, and of course, you see people uh, reverencing the icon. So you see bowing down and stuff like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Old Testament prohibitions come to mind. And so, yeah, that, that could definitely be a tough thing. Um, so you're looking into orthodoxy, but you're also reading about the papacy. Steve Ray's material it seems convincing. Is that really what pushed you over the edge or was it something else that made you end up going the Catholic route rather than the Eastern Orthodox route? Yeah, it really was Stephen Ray's book. That's what really did it for me. And like I said, I was talking to a lot of my subscribers. They were sending me so much research and information and podcasts and lectures to watch and books to read. So I just had a lot of conversations with Catholic subscribers and Orthodox subscribers, and they both explained the opposite perspectives. But his book was really a huge influence on me. Yeah, I, I I know I have a copy of it, but I, I haven't read it yet. I really should. Um, now, William, I, I know I kind of have you hanging in the background there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me give oh, you a no. chance to jump in here, and then I'm going to come back and ask some additional questions of, about your time in Catholicism. But yeah, let me pass it over to you for a moment, William. I'm, I'm really enjoying hearing you all dialogue. Um, uh, thank you for joining us today, Lizzie. Uh, you, you mentioned Steve Ray. Have, have you ever talked with him before? Yeah. When I announced to the world that I was an RCIA and becoming Catholic, I was doing a radio interview and they surprised me and brought him on during the interview. So I actually got to talk to him and thank him for helping me be Catholic. So very cool. it was really, really cool. He's a very good friend of mine. That's why I was asking. Oh, nice. I, I speak with Steve very often. That is a very good book, by the way. Um, I think you're talking about his book on um, papacy, right? Mm-hmm. That is a very good book. It's full of really good information. Uh, you brought up a point earlier about the monarchical bishopric. Um, I wonder, I'm, I'm sure you've read Ignatius of Antioch. I'm sure you were mm -hmm. probably blown away by Clement of Rome. And, and as you kept reading, you were probably just really wondering the way I kind of did it, because I converted as well from Protestantism. I was Protestant, um, but did not grow up Catholic, did not grow up practicing um, any kind of Catholic faith. I was Protestant. Did you get to the point where you really wondered, what am I doing where I'm at? I imagine you eventually got to that point to where you said, what am I doing going to a church that really doesn't resemble anything of the sort of apostolic Christianity? Did that ever hit you? And when that did, I wonder, how did you react realizing that perhaps you would be alienating friend, fam, family and friends? I knew immediately it's something that I didn't talk to my parents about for eight months. Like once I knew, once I began believing in real presence of the Eucharist, it was like yeah. eight months later when I finally told my parents just because I knew that it would cause a huge rift and I didn't even know how to begin explaining it to them. So it was really a heartbreaking time and a lot of sadness and fear. There was so much joy. I felt like the Bible was coming alive when I'd be in an Orthodox church and seeing the apostles and John the Baptist and Mary, like it felt real in a way it never had before. And I was so excited because, you know, the book of Acts is the history of the church. And I realized like oh, yeah. it continues, <laughs> like you can yeah. keep reading about it. So it was amazing, but I cried so much because I knew I would get rejected by a lot of people. I knew it would cause so much chaos in my family. And I mean, it did, it was awful. My dad stopped talking to me for a couple of months and he's like the closest person in my life. So it was a huge, huge sacrifice giving up Church of Christ. May, may I ask you, and, and I'm, I'm very familiar with the Church of Christ, particularly because my, um, my wife's family went there for quite some time 
Um, and I've got friends that are very, very entrenched within the Church of Christ. Mm. So um, I'm very familiar with the Campbellite movement and what have you. I wonder, though, and I'm familiar with the schism within the Campbellite movement. I'm sure you know j just what I'm talking about. I, I wonder, um, and, and I'm just, I hope it's not an intruding by me asking you, did your family convert to Catholicism after all? Or, or, or was more or less, they did not? Okay, I see. I, I understand and that that's that is quite tough because uh, you know when I converted to Catholicism I felt the um, the breaking apart of a lot of relationships I had had before mm -hmm. where people really look at you differently reject you altogether but you bring up a really good point that you're responsible for your own salvation really um, mm -hmm. no nobody else is so really you're responsible when you know the truth to do what you view as the right thing. I wonder when you were Protestant, was the issue, I'm gonna bring up two issues and I'm curious what your thoughts are. Infant baptism, did that ever come up before you became Catholic or after? And the canon of scripture, viewing the fact that as you know very well, the list of books within Protestantism vary greatly from that within Catholicism. Did any of those issues, once you began looking at them and studying them, did you ever say, hey, look, the apostolic church, they had it right, and the church where I'm a part of, they're missing these books, so we're always viewed as holy writ. Did that, did that ever come across your mind? About infant baptism and salvation? Right, yes. I think that it was pretty easy. Like I was talking to some of my subscribers and they explained that there were entire families getting baptized in the early church. So it was pretty obvious immediately, but my patron saint is St. Irenaeus and he was taught by Polycarp who was taught by the apostle John and Irenaeus talks about infant baptism. So it was a pretty easy jump for me believing in that. Right. And what about the canon? Um... I don't know if you've studied that in depth, the fact that the Catholic Bible is, is bigger mm. than the Protestant Bible. So I'm curious because for me, and the only reason I'm, I'm, I'm picking your brain on them, because really funny enough, that kind of got me started on my journey. Really, mm. when, I, when I realized, and, and I've talked to Michael about it before, Michael knows quite well, when I realized, that, and I realized this even when I was Protestant, but I was always under the impression that those darn Catholics just added those those yeah, other books. Yeah, yeah. So what went through your mind when you found out that from the time when the church recognized what was apostolic scripture, that those were part of the scripture, what, what went through your mind? So I actually stopped believing in Sola Scriptura three years before I became Catholic. Wow. <laughs> because in our religion department in college, we were learning about how the Bible, they didn't have the full Bible canon of scripture for several hundred years. And yeah. so I realized that you need tradition to define which books are in the Bible. Because I was learning about Gnosticism and all the fake gospels in the early church and so we need church tradition to be like these are the real gospels so once i learned that it was a council of catholic bishops that decided which books were in the bible and then later i learned that during the reformation it wasn't just these old testament books but martin luther also tried to remove hebrews and revelation and james and so i immediately distrusted them taking other books out of the bible too just because it really hit close to home that they were trying to remove New Testament books that I'd grown up with. Right. And that, that is a very, very good response. Um, and, I, and I wonder, when you, when you converted to Catholicism, or maybe even perhaps before, I'm, I'm, this is a question I kind of like to ask people very frequently. You brought up uh, the papacy. That was one major thing that um, I appreciated you brought up. What for you, was the biggest stumbling block because for me for me i can tell you i'll tell you right now and it's very different now for me my biggest stumbling block was mary as a protestant i don't know what yours would have been the marian dogma was really hard but i did a lot of research into it and it was pretty easy for me to understand but the sexual ethics was the hardest part, especially the birth control teaching and how the church will never accept gay marriage. 
I'm a millennial, so as a Protestant, I was actually pro-gay marriage, and I would talk about that on my YouTube channel, and I was kind of a safe haven for a lot of my subscribers who'd been really hurt by the way Protestants have reacted to it in not a Christ-like way. You shouldn't kick your child out of your home. You shouldn't kick people out of the church if they have sexual attraction a different way. But especially the birth control teaching, just because I kind of saw it as something that was so beneficial for women, helping women go to college, getting PhDs, med school. Like I thought that birth control was the most empowering thing and helping women be intellectual. So I saw no birth control as wanting to push women down and not letting women be ambitious, which now seems kind of silly. Right. And I've done a lot of research in a natural family planning. I actually recently interviewed an NFP instructor on my YouTube. Incredible. But at the time I thought that natural family planning had like a 5% success rate or something. Like I didn't understand that it's so scientific. Incredible. Ed. Thank you very much for that. I'll probably um, I'll try and pick your brain in a bit, a, a, a bit more in a little bit. I want to toss it over to uh, to Michael. Yeah. And, um, you know, are, are you able to hear me, by the way? Is yeah. my microphone? OK, good. Um, so one of my questions that I have is um, what did you do with all of the scandals in the church? Mm -hmm. I mean, surely that somewhat deterred you from Catholicism. How did you overcome that? So when I was converting in, I actually wasn't thinking about it that much just because the major sex abuse scandal happened, I think, in 2003. So I was really young then. I was in elementary school. I really wasn't aware of it. Mm -hmm. But right after my confirmation, the Pennsylvania report came out. And that was really hard because all of a sudden I had this amazing experience with my confirmation, being able to receive the Eucharist. I was fully Catholic. And then suddenly I'm hit with all this horror and evil. And I was expected to be like a spokesperson at the time talking about this and helping people understand. But I've done a lot of research into it. There are two John, I think it's called the John Ray reports on the USCCB website and they're each like 200 pages. So I scanned through them and I found that the sex abuse cases, they were like spiking up and they spiked down starting in 19, the 1980s. And so all the cases are from a long time ago. And I was volunteering at my church to be a Eucharistic minister and scripture reading. So I had to do the protecting God's children class Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing all the policies in place. Like you can never have a classroom door opened if you're not using it. There always have to be two adults in every room. Everyone's mm -hmm. gone through this class of how to catch predators before they um, hurt a child. So now I'm at the point where I can explain to people that the Catholic Church is one of the safest places for children today. So that just gave me so much confidence, really reading the reports and studying the history of it and then taking that class. But obviously it's still horrific and evil. And sure. it's hard talking about, because if you explain that it's something that happened in the past, it almost invalidates victims and all the pain that they went through. So it's really, really hard to learn about and to be aware of. It is. And, and another thing that I think that I, I actually saw on your channel was, um, that you were struggling with OCD. Is that correct? Did I get you right? No, there? I actually have bipolar disorder. Bipolar. Not okay. I got you. <laughs> you know, I think there's a, probably a whole lot of people that could relate to both actually o OCD. I yeah. struggle a lot with OCD. Um, but I think there's a whole lot of people that I could also relate to that. Um, how did that kind of come to play when it comes to your conversion to Catholicism? Did it impact it in any way? Yeah. So interestingly enough, I was off meds and I was very manic when I was researching into the church. And I think God really redeemed that and used it to help me because I was more trusting than usual. I wasn't sleeping that much. So I had so much time to just read and read and read and binge on research. So I got like very obsessed with it because I was manic. And then with my depression phases, in evangelicalism and my Protestant church, 
anytime I would be in depression, it was very much like, God will never give you more than you can handle. Trust God's plan. Just really superficial things that don't help anyone suffering. But yeah. the Catholic Catholicism has a really um, robust view of suffering. And walking into a Catholic church, seeing Jesus on the cross, and he understands what it's like for me to be in depression because he didn't feel God when he was on the cross. So it's so comforting, the Catholic view on suffering. It really, really helps me when I'm in depression in a way that Protestantism never could. Yeah, I think that's a message a lot of people really need to hear. And I really appreciated that you you put yourself out there and, and um, told people about this because uh, there's a lot of people that are struggling with all kinds of things. But redemptive mm -hmm. suffering is a very, very good way for us to take those um, pains, those struggles and bring mm -hmm. them to the cross. I think that's an excellent point that you bring up. One, one of the things that I've dealt with because I'm OCD is scrupulosity. Mm. Um, in the past, I've had to deal with that a lot, especially when it comes to the sacrament of confession. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it um, or if you've Some ever experienced Some of my subscribers deal yeah. with that a lot, so I pray for yeah. them with it. It's, yeah. it's kind of the spiritual version of OCD. <laughs> Basically, you're, you're very um, constantly introspective and worried that you have committed a sin. Um, mm. even when it's, it, it's extremely likely that you haven't committed a sin. And most people would say, this isn't a sin. You're constantly in fear that you've committed mm. one. Um, so you're overly scrupulous in your criteria on how often you need to go to confession or whether or not you should receive the, the Eucharist because you fear that you're not, um, in a state of, uh, grace. So, you know, one, one of the things that I found that was very helpful was redemptive suffering. You know, the, the mm -hmm. matter that you're talking about here, it definitely did bring, um, some relief because you can see that God takes that pain. He takes that suffering and he brings good out of it. He, he's not mm -hmm. just going to leave you, uh, with no purpose to this thing. Um, now, I think some of the other videos that I recall seeing a while back were on the liturgy. Now, I want to say that you may have gone to a Latin Mass. Is that correct? I went to Latin Mass for five months in 2017. It was mm -hmm. like the first, I mean, I went to Mass once in college with one of my Catholic friends, but I went to Mass. I was going to Orthodox Divine Liturgy and Latin Mass every week. <laughs> so I was experiencing the East and the West. <laughs> what did you think when you're when you're seeing the Tridentine Liturgy or seeing the Orthodox Liturgy? What were some of the pros and cons of each? I'm kind of curious. <laughs> well, Latin Mass felt less like Catholicism than my impression of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like how Orthodox was easier to accept emotionally. Latin Mass was as well, because it felt so different than my first experience at Mass. Mm -hmm. But Latin Mass was very meditational. I really, mm -hmm. really loved it a lot. I was able to focus on prayer and like analyze my life within the liturgy. And people get so mad when I make this comparison. But it almost reminds me of yoga. Because obviously I don't do like Buddhist yoga or Eastern yoga. I do like mm -hmm. westernized yoga and meditation sometimes. That's Christian. So it almost reminds me of being like so slowed down and relaxed. So I really liked Latin Mass a lot. Mm -hmm. But I loved the art of Orthodox so much more. Just because like what I was saying earlier, where you look up and there's the apostles, John the Baptist, Mary, Jesus, it like comes alive. Mm -hmm. So the aspect of incense and church art that really appealed to me the absolute most. So I love Eastern Catholicism, obviously. Yeah. And that was actually going to be my next question. I mean, have you been to Eastern Catholic liturgies? What, what did you think of them? Yeah, I've been many times. I really, really love, but the current parish I'm going to is Novus Ordo. And I have so many close relationships there. I think it's hard to find Eastern Catholic parishes. I mean, hopefully one day, I'll live close to one of them, but yeah. they're more rare and difficult to find. Oh, yeah. So that's I'm a challenge. about 
five, four or five hours away from the closest Eastern Catholic parish. And, and I think it's a mission parish. It's not an actual full established parish. So. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty far away. I'm uh, in Northeastern Louisiana. There's, there's mostly Baptists and Pentecostals here. That's essentially what it is. So you talk about the, the Novus Ordo there. What did you think about it in comparison to the other liturgies? Was it pretty good experience, negative experience? What, what was your experience like? I love Novus Ordo. People get so mad, but I love Novus Ordo more than Latin Mass because you can follow mm -hmm. along more. And I mm -hmm. think my personality type, I'm very like type A. I want to know everything. I love school lectures. So I love how you're able to like pay attention to every single detail and know everything going on. I just, I love it so much more. And I think Latin Mass definitely has a place. Um, Eastern Catholicism has a place. Mm -hmm. But where I'm at in my life right now, I really like Novus Ordo. And I mean, I'm so close to yeah. my priest and my RCIA group and everyone who comes to Bible study and rosary group. So the people there, I really love. I, I, I understand. I mean, when I, when I, especially when I first converted to Catholicism, I was very turned off to the Latin Mass. I did not mm -hmm. understand why the entire thing was in Latin, why it needed to be in Latin. So I was very much gravitated towards the, the Novus Ordo. Um, now, you mentioned meditation, you know, during the liturgy. You, you felt that was pretty conducive. You know, one of the curious things that I was, or one of the things I was curious about was, what have you discovered within Catholicism that was helpful as far as meditation, devotions, prayers, stuff like that? So obviously I've been reading the Bible my entire life. I love reading the Bible, but the rosary is a whole different way of thinking about the Bible. And I always, I just made a video on the rosary, but I always describe it to Protestants as if you're going on street view in Google maps. So before I would kind of like see the stories as if you're like flying over them, but the rosary forces you to analyze it so much as if you're walking on the streets of Jesus and you're in the story. So it's really helped me focus on different details of the Gospels in a way I never would have thought imaginable. And just like how I was talking about how icons make it come alive. I just think everything having to do with the Orthodox and Catholicism, it just makes everything come alive and feel so much more real in a way I mm -hmm. never thought possible. Mm -hmm. So the rosary, were there also any um, books that you read that were helpful as far as devotions? I feel like it was mostly just the rosary. I mean, one of my subscribers sent me a rosary book on like how to pray it. I forget what it's called. So that helped me out. But Saint Saint Louis Montfort probably. Probably Saint Louis de Montfort. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, he has a he has a book on that. It's um it's pretty good. Um I have to ask, which church fathers do you find the most interesting in why? <laughs> okay, so this isn't a church father. But I love Origen so yeah. much. Yeah. He's just such like a passionate, insightful. I actually, my intuition is I think he had bipolar disorder. Just hearing <laughs> about the way like his father described him and everything I've read. So I so wish, I hope he's in heaven. I pray for mm -hmm. him if he's in purgatory. Mm -hmm. um, I also love Jerome. He's a mm. very passionate writer. He kind of attacks people and goes after them. So it's kind of entertaining the way he writes, but he writes like some really short essays that have helped me understand things like relics. And then obviously my patron Saint Irenaeus, anytime I want to understand things, I mean, I have like against heresies, but it's like huge, but I'll Google things a lot like Irenaeus into baptism, Irenaeus relics, Irenaeus this, and on new advent, everything will come up. So I, I really you. love how everything's free online, like mm. Aquinas as well. You can like Google anything and there'll be a Summa article on it. So easy to understand. So I love New Advent. I love earlychristianwritings.com. Oh, yeah. New New Advent has some amazing resources on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. You know, Irenaeus that you chose him, I think that was an excellent choice. Um, a lot of people overlook him. But I mean, you could argue that he's the first systematic theologian. He writes this extremely mm -hmm. long treatise, very good, against the Gnostics in five books. And it has just a million jewels mm -hmm. and gems in them. So, yeah. I mean, and it's giving us a look into second century Christianity, which mm -hmm. is extremely, extremely helpful and insightful. So I think that was a very good saying. You mentioned Origen and Jerome. I, I like that. I like that. You know why? Because I like church fathers especially that focused on 
um, scripture commentaries. Mm -hmm. And those are the big names right there. Origin and Jerome. Of course, by extension, you also have Bede. Some consider him a church father. Um, but definitely Origin and Jerome, they have some good stuff. I don't know if you've had the chance. Um, you might have some mixed views on it. But if you ever get the chance, read Origin's commentary on Leviticus. It's extremely interesting. Okay. Sometimes he's stretching. He's going too far with it, with the <laughs> allegory. But overall, I love the allegory. I like how he goes beyond just the literal type and interpretation and starts to apply these things to Christ. And Jerome has a really good way of balancing those things out, of, mm -hmm. of interpreting the scripture according to the literal sense, but then coming with an allegorical sense too. So I can mm -hmm. really appreciate him too. Um, although, yeah, he, he was pretty, uh, pretty obnoxious at times. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading one of his uh, letters to Augustine not too long ago. Oh, yeah, they was, hated each other. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it, it reminded me of a lot of the internet apologists and how they interact. <laughs> so, funny thing is, uh, the funny thing is, Jerome was smarter of the two, but yeah. he was wrong. Augustine yeah. was the one that was correct in their argument. That's correct. Which That's is correct. Incredible. It's incredible, mm -hmm. isn't it? It really is. I, I would also agree that he is the smarter of the oh, two, yeah. although I would say that Augustine was more accomplished in his his Agreed. works. But, mm -hmm. I mean, Jerome's right up there with, of course, translating the Vulgate oh, and all of man. his commentaries and some of his theological treatises. But I'd have to give it to Augustine at the end of the day if I... if I uh, He won the debate. In the end, he yeah. won the debate. I agree. I agree. Well, let me pass it over to you for a few minutes here, William, anything that you have. And then I also want to get to some chat questions, if that's okay, Lizzie. Okay. But yeah, Lizzie, you brought something up really, really um, interested me when you brought up, you said that maybe origin could have been bipolar. And <laughs> I mean, it really did interest me because when I, um, anytime preparing for a debate, I'm always looking at the church fathers, Tertullian, mm -hmm. or, Tertullian origin, as you know, or not considered yeah. early church fathers but the one thing that really i'd never really thought of it and looked at it from that point of view but you're looking at it from a different point of view than i would but thinking about it i've read a lot of origin and you bring up a really good point because sometimes you've got let me give you an example sometimes you have origin saying incredible things about our mother mary and then a book that he's written a few years later he's disparaging her and then another writing a few years later, he's back to talking incredibly elevated about her. Then a few books later, written a few years later, disparaging her. It always really kind of threw me off and made me wonder, what is going on in Origin's <laughs> mind? So I wonder, I mean, I, I'm not saying you're right or wrong. I, I found it a really incredible commentary. But I mean, I wonder what would make you think that he could have been bipolar? Was it maybe that, that he kind of flip-flopped a lot? Or what, what really was it? Yeah, so in, I think it's in Eusebius, but he describes Origen's father as like watching over him when he slept to make sure like the daimon or something didn't come out of him. So that was really interesting to me and the way Eusebius talked about him in church history. But that's interesting what you said too, how his views would like go back and forth and change through the years. So yeah, they, they really would. Um, in particularly in particular about um. Uh about Mary, which would always struck me as kind of odd, uh, even though the final statement we have written about him on Mary was very elevated, very positive statement. Mm -hmm. It always struck me as, wow, what, why, you know, I've got one book of origin talking about Mary this way, and then another one, you know, and at the end of the day, we've got to be honest, I kind of like you, I kind of hope origin is in heaven. I kind of think he would have been in heaven. He didn't visibly leave the church the way Tertullian did. You know, mm -hmm. he didn't visibly leave the church the way Tertullian did. So even with Tertullian, we have later church fathers say that he returned to the bosom of the church, whether that is likely or not. It's probably not. Yeah. But I'd like to, at the end of the day, I, I don't know if this was the same for you, Lizzie, but when I first became Catholic, two major figures for me in my life were Tertullian and Origen. And mm -hmm. I was almost saddened when, as I began my journey towards Catholic, I was also where you were at. It was either orthodoxy or Catholicism. I discerned orthodoxy for a while. But during the journey towards Catholicism, and once I got to the point of finding out that Origen Tertullian didn't make the cut for being church fathers, I was, I was quite saddened. 
I mm -hmm. don't know if your reaction was the same. Yeah, I mean, it's heartbreaking. Like, Tertullian is so necessary to prove a lot of early dogmas, like, especially about Mary. And it's just kind of devastating. And recently I was reading and I found out that Marcion ended up coming back to the church. He, like, decided he was going to be um, Catholic again, but then he died before he could be, like, in like officially initiated into the church. So it's crazy to me that someone like Marcion could be in heaven who caused so much disaster, but then someone like Origen or Tertullian wouldn't be in heaven. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, and the, and the beautiful thing is, is that we can we can speculate at the end of the day that perhaps maybe they are in heaven as the church has never really, has never made a declaration uh, either which mm -hmm. way. So we can be very hopeful of that. Earlier you were talking to them, and, and I kind of want to tread into maybe uh, a little bit of a controversial waters, if you will. You brought up how you did, you kind of picked Catholicism over orthodoxy. Correct me if I'm wrong, kind of when you were looking at the issue of the papacy. Mm -hmm. I, want, I wonder, and I'm curious, and if, if, if the answer is no, you can just say no. Was there anything else? Maybe, maybe you looked at anything else comparing them. Maybe you said, uh, you know what, I'm also looking at this. Uh, comparing this to Catholicism or vice versa, and you said, I'm, I prefer the Catholic route. Was there anything else that maybe tipped you more towards Catholicism? I think the current disunity is really interesting, just how the Catholic Church, like under the Pope, we remain really, really united and we're the same. And I mean, during liturgy, like we have the same scripture readings every week. And so the unity factor is really important. And if you look at the Orthodox Church today, they're just not as united. And I think that's something that really struck me a lot when I was looking at kind of the implications of that. What would you, I'm just curious, what would you say, and I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate with you, but that's okay. What would you say if I were to tell you that within Catholicism, there's just as much disunity, you've got the state of Bacontis, you have all these other groups that are just, you know what, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't believe Pope Francis is a real pope. Uh, what would you say to somebody that heard you make that argument and said, hey, well, hey, you know what, uh, um, orthodoxy is so dysfunctional, but you've got dysfunction on your side too. How would you reply? Would you maybe reply by telling them, yeah, but let's examine the doctrines, let's examine the official teachings. How would you reply? Well, I think recently, it was it the Russian patriarch? He kind of excommunicated the rest of the Orthodox Church. Something like that would never happen on like, I mean, maybe it could, but like on an official level in Catholicism, you don't find like the cardinal excommunicating the Pope or something. And so I think that maybe there's disunity on like a personal level, but not on like as much of an official level. Gotcha. Got you. That that fantastic answer. I, I really kind of just wanted to pick your brain, wondering kind of, you know, what you thought, what was your, your mindset. And I, I greatly, really, really appreciate it. I know for me, uh, I was very, um, I very much really did like orthodoxy a lot before mm -hmm. I went uh, the Catholic route. And you brought up a really good point earlier when you kind of, um, you can go to yahoo.com or go to any front page. And when there's a scandal breaking, you're more likely to read about the scandal within Catholicism rather than reading about it, about orthodoxy. So then that brings you to the question that why would anybody choose Catholicism when it's always under, under attack in the media? So I imagine you must have done a real good amount of research to really have said, you know what? My choice is Catholicism. And I, my, my next question for you before I toss it over to Michael so we can have a few audience questions is, do you have any regrets about your conversion at all? Yes. I regret not telling my friends and family immediately when I started reading. Okay. I believe my parents would be Catholic today if I'd shown them the books I was reading, talked about the arguments, not even brought them to mass, but just be, like be like, I'm reading this book right now. Read this chapter with me. And I was actually living at home when all of this was happening. I took kind of a gap year after college before moving back to California because I was in depression. And I could have Sorry brought my parents into the entire process. And I was so scared. And so I didn't. And I really, really regret that a lot. Because otherwise, I think they'd be Catholic if they were open to seeing all the information. Now, before we hop on over to honest questions, I, I'm very curious. Do, would you... Would you say the possibility is still there 
that they would maybe be open to Catholicism, be open to ancient Christianity, apostolic Christianity, to converting any time in the future? Do you see any hope there at all? Absolutely. Cool. I pray the rosary for the conversion into Catholicism Amen. of like a long list of people in my life. So I'm very confident. Like I trust Mary's prayer so much. And I offer up my suffering and my bipolar for the conversion of my family and friends. So I'm so confident, like on my own, it wouldn't happen. But with Mary's prayers and prayers of different saints that I love, I really think they'll end up converting. Lizzie, please remember me in your prayers. I appreciate that answer. Okay. <laughs> Toss that over to Michael. Yeah, we, we have quite a few uh, questions here. Actually, let me uh, pull it back up here. Um, large variety too. Okay, so here, this one is from email. Um, was Lizzie's conclusion on the papacy the only reason why she selected Catholicism over Orthodoxy? Did she see any other material theological differences between East and West? I know you kind of answered that with William, but if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, so we disagree on different issues like the filioque, their understanding of purgatory, the Immaculate Conception. I think that there's things that I notice where you need the Pope as the figurehead and the church magisterium to kind of give you a definitive yes or no on these different issues that come up. And the Catholic Church is more like meticulous with defining things and explaining them. And I think because of that, the Orthodox Church says that we disagree on major things. But I think that the Catholic Church through the years has had different heresies to respond to. And they have brought out like really detailed answers to all these questions that the Orthodox and Catholic Church could disagree on. Yeah, that's um, that's well put. That's actually one of the, the things that um, makes me more attracted to Catholicism over Orthodoxy. Although there's a lot of things that I, I find more appealing in Orthodoxy than Catholicism, but uh, the magisterium would definitely be something that... Um, you know, is, is in favor of Catholicism. Um, there's another one on here from Joe. Um, how does Lizzie feel about the current Pope, Pope Francis? <laughs> I love Pope Francis so much. It's I talk about this in so many live streams. I hate that he gets so much hate, and it's mostly only from Americans, and I don't get it at all. And I think that the way he talks about different issues and leads, it was attractive to me. It attracted me to Catholicism years before I even became Catholic. So he'll always have the most special place in my heart because he was the Pope who I converted under. And I think he's an amazing leader. So I don't hate him at all. This one is from um, Jorge. Any tips for sharing the faith on social media effectively? not getting mad at protestants because i used to be really hateful believe so many lies i thought catholics weren't christians and i was able to convert so if you don't get mad and don't get sensitive and just answer people's questions i think there's hope for everyone in becoming catholic mm. um you kind of answered this a little bit earlier at least somewhat uh bindi uh -huh. is asking is there anything in the catholic church that lizzie takes an issue with yeah, so during my confirmation, I basically vowed that I agree with the church on all teaching. Like, I believe and accept that it's revealed by God. So I don't disagree with any dogma or theology in Catholicism. I mean, there's things like sometimes I lean towards certain heresies. Like, I'm like, oh, what if this? Like, one of the reasons I love Origen is he thought that, like, universal salvation, even the demons will be saved. So there's certain mm -hmm. things that like I'm attracted to, but I know it's wrong. So like emotionally, I might feel something, but my emotions don't matter because they're they were wrong on so many things. So yeah, I accept all the church's teachings. And it's I funny you mentioned that that uh, last point here. I'm actually reading a paper. Uh, let's see by John Socks, uh, S.J. So Jesuit on the issue of origin and his his view of apocatastases and apocatastases as a whole. So <laughs> I'm actually reading, <laughs> reading. it's literally right next to you right now. So it's interesting you've answered that. Um, this next question, kind of a short one. Uh, you may have already answered it. What What's your favorite pope? <laughs> or who is your favorite pope? So I'm reading a book on all the popes right now, and there's so many. I feel like I have not done enough research. I'm maybe like a tenth of the way through the book. But I mean, there are popes who I really hate a lot, like Pope Victor tried to excommunicate the entire Eastern Church over Easter, which was so stupid. Mm -hmm. 
And then I forget his name, but the Pope during the Arian controversy was so weak and we don't even yeah. consider him a saint, but he basically like signed a piece of paper lying and saying that he agreed with the heresy because he was being like, he was banished and sent away. And he just, yeah, he's just, like so many popes were martyred and killed and tortured for the church and you have to deal with it. And he wasn't strong enough to deal with the persecution when they needed him the most. That's the case of Liberius. You know, there's a few who vindicate him and say that he didn't sign it or he was just under pressure. But it's curious in the Roman martyrology, even with those who did defend him and say that he didn't actually sign this semi-Arian or Arianizing creed. Um, they, it's still interesting that he's the first pope was not in the Roman mm -hmm. martyrology. He's actually the first pope who was not a saint. Uh, so that that is telling either way it lands. Um, Lewis asks, here, here's a question. Some Protestant apologists also read church fathers and draw opposite conclusions from them. How do you address their use of patristics? It's cherry picking. So one of the things, the Eucharist, so Catholics view it as literally the body and blood of Christ but it's also a symbol. So church fathers will talk about it as a symbol and they'll be like, the church fathers believe in the memorial view of communion, but mm. no, you can read other writings mm -hmm. and you can see them talking about it as real presence. Another example. So um, my boyfriend's a theology PhD student and he's reading about Augustine a lot right now. Mm. And Augustine talks about how no one, he said in some writing how no one's free, no one is sinless. <laughs> But then in other writings, he'll be like, Mary was sinless. And he felt like he didn't even need to mention Mary because everyone knows that Mary is sinless. So it's so easy to cherry pick. Yeah, this is actually something that came a lot in uh, up in the Middle Ages, kind of in the very beginning of the Middle Ages and especially in later uh, Middle Ages, the issue of Augustine, because he could be read in multiple ways, especially on the matter of the eucharist that you're bringing up here yeah uh, i think i think ultimately i mean augustine was catholic and what protestants are doing is they're misunderstanding some things but mm -hmm. because of some of the things in his writings there were two sides that were kind of you know mm -hmm. in conflict i don't i don't know if you ever heard of uh retramnus and radbertus in the ninth century i want to say but there were two monks who were fighting over this issue of did augustine believe in the real presence or was he just kind of a spiritual uh eucharist kind of guy so uh, -huh. uh this is a pretty old controversy elijah asks uh <laughs> when are you going to make the video on your favorite Catholic rappers? <laughs> I've been promising this video, but I actually gave up music for Lent. So I uh, stopped thinking about the video, but thank you for the reminder. I will end up making that video. I, I did not know. I mean, I knew there were Christian rappers. I never knew that there were specifically Catholic rappers. I, this is so new, many. new to me. And they include wow. so much theology in them. Although I did see a rapping priest, a Catholic rapping priest. Oh, I know who back. you're talking about from Australia. I, I, yeah, I, 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 he may have been. I, I don't know, but I, I did see him. I'm drawing a blank on his name at the moment. Um, next one is from Charles here. Let me uh, find it. Sorry, Charles, that I didn't have it pulled up right away. Um, John Paul II believed in evolution. Many Roman Catholics do, and so does Liz. How did we become sinners deserving God's wrath if we evolved? <laughs> so I actually have like a quote in my live streams. It's like an inside joke with my subscribers where I'm like, you can be a stupid Catholic. So the church has like, I forget which Pope in last century, but wrote a letter encouraging everyone to believe in evolution. You guys probably know the name of it. And so, I mean, the church created academia and universities in the middle ages and there were so many catholic scientists like mendel and it's just absurd to not believe in modern science so yeah obviously i believe in evolution yeah you know the jesuits especially were really really big into um, much of the things that we see today in science but especially seismology one, one thing that's interesting about them is because there were so Jesuits spread all out over the world, they could perform these experiments in universities. 
on seismology and, and kind of see the way things were happening. So they were kind of pioneers in that area since they were all over the place. I mean, without a doubt, the Catholic Church has definitely been pro-science. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so related question. Uh, what, what's Does Lizzie have a view on the evolution of dogma? So I think that there's seeds for everything in scripture like the doctrine of the Trinity, they wouldn't have been able to parse out, like the apostles wouldn't have parsed it out, but that doesn't mean that it's not original and from the apostolic tradition. So there's like seeds of things and then they grow. Yeah, um, this one is about uh, Aquinas. You you kind of mentioned that you were reading uh, yeah. the Summa New Advent. So have you ever read Aquinas? Uh, it, is it mostly the Summa that you've been reading or in any of his other materials? just the summa if i ever have a question about it i'll just google aquinas mary new advent aquinas relics new advent aquinas purgatory new advent <laughs> you just google and then the article comes up and it's so short and so easy to understand i love the way he writes he just writes in like logic formulas it's you know for me aquinas was extremely difficult i i had tried to study philosophy and aquinas for years and i just it wasn't making a whole lot of sense. I, I, I went to Christendom Graduate School. I finally um, took some classes there on Aquinas, and I was finally able to start understanding what he was saying in the Summa. But do you find him to be pretty difficult at times, or is he relatively easy to understand in the Summa for you? I mean, we studied him a lot in college, so I think that might have helped me. I had several Catholic professors, so we read, oh, okay. but... Obviously, I've not. I will probably never read the entire Summa. It's very, very, very dense. But when you read parts of it, it's helpful. I don't see any other chat questions, so we'll we'll go ahead and uh, stop with the chat questions there. Unless uh, any anybody else who has any questions just burning in their bosom, they can go ahead and put them in now. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, I, I'm not seeing any. Uh, any more coming through? Oh, uh, here's one more that we'll take. Uh, did you read the Deuterocanonical books? You mentioned that you read. Yes, scripture. my favorite is Tobit and Sirach are my absolute favorites. So I really, really love them a lot. You know, I, I I'm, I'm curious. Why do you like Tobit? <laughs> it's very much told like a story. It's like a narrative structure. So I really, really like that about it. And it talks about um, donating money to the poor and how mm -hmm. that's like the most beautiful yeah. spiritual right. thing. There's a lot of good stuff in Tobit. One of oh. my favorite um, commentaries by Bede is on Tobit. But the book is incredible. It's extremely allegorical in pointing yeah. to Christ. And that, that's one of the things I, I love about how there's a literal sense to it, but then there's an allegorical sense mm -hmm. that points to Christ. And his church. And so that's one of the reasons why it's it's one of my favorite from uh, the Deuterocanonical books. I, I would definitely agree with you there. And of course, Sirach as well. It's it's wonderful. Um, well, good. I really appreciate you coming on, Lizzie. This has been excellent. Um, thank you for coming on. Go ahead and put in a plug for anything that you're doing. I know you put in a plug for your channel, but uh, anything else that you're doing? Yeah, so I eventually will have a memoir coming out about my conversion story and a memoir about bipolar disorder. So I'm working on two books and I'm really excited to be publishing, hopefully this year or next year. So I'm working on that. And then I upload to my YouTube channel several times a week and I do a lot of live streams on YouTube and Instagram. What's your next video going to be on? I actually don't know, but I'm definitely writing a video script on how Mary is sinless. People have been asking me to make a video about that for a mm. long time because I made a video on, I think, all the other Marian dogmas. I have like a playlist about Mary theology on my YouTube channel. So <clears throat> that's William's favorite topic. You might want to get it with him. He, he has some gems <laughs> on, yeah? writing a, on, writing yeah. a book on that. Yeah. So cool. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I uh, would love to talk to you about that. I, um, I think I've probably debated that issue more than any other Catholic. I wow. Think. Yeah. Okay. Oh, one more from Elijah. This is a, a good one. I'll, uh, I'll ask it. Um, have you ever heard of Father Chad Ripperger? 
so many people tell me to listen to him and my impression of it maybe my subscribers are wrong but they've told me that he believes bipolar is demon possession or something which hmm. really enrages me because i'm really pro medication and like i'm sure god can heal mental illness but i want hmm. to be on medication because <laughs> i'm sure pro no i know Ch father uh ripperger um I, I I do know him a little bit personally. I've co corresponded at least with him a few times, but I know his material pretty well. And I don't think he, he would agree with the idea that bipolar is um, demonic. Now, may, maybe I'm wrong, but he, he never makes a pretty, that. yeah, and he I, makes a I've pretty, a lot of his videos on demons. Right. Oh yeah. Me, me too. He makes a pretty good distinction mm -hmm. between there's people who are dealing with things that are of a, um, a natural order and there are things that are perhaps of a preternatural um issue and so he, he tends to make those distinctions so i i would be very surprised if he actually said that but uh, i have well i feel bad if i'm misrepresenting him but i was told that by some of my subscribers so i'm like yeah. absolutely not I don't know. I'll see if I can uh, look into that, but I, I'd be very surprised if, if he did say that, because I, I would agree with you that, no, that's that's definitely not the case. Not that mm -hmm. demons can't mimic some things that we deal with on a natural level, but I would not yeah. say that natural disorder itself is, is actually preternatural, no. Uh, so I, I would definitely agree with you on that one. But in, anyways, again, thank you for coming on. This was truly excellent. You're welcome on the show anytime. Uh, Lizzie from Lizzie's Answers. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, William, for coming on. Thank you for having me. Everyone, thank you for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, share this material on your social media. Until next time, God bless you all. Bye.